All right, we are starting a brand new journey together into the Gospels over the next 90 days. And what we're doing is we're really saturating ourselves individually and as a community uh, in the narrative of the Gospel story. We're doing that through a couple of avenues. One is our daily readings. How many of you guys have signed up for the Bible in 90 days, or the Gospel in 90 days? Not the whole Bible. We're just doing the Gospels. Okay. So if you haven't, you want to go on your Bible app, you want to, you know, do in the search engine, Bible Project, Gospels, you'll find a 90-day reading plan. We're only like five or six days into it. You can still catch up. These are really quick readings. If you don't like reading, you can even just listen to the audio. It's right there. Uh, but we're doing that as a, as a community this week, or this, this summer. We're going to go through that uh, together. We're talking about the Gospels uh, in, our, in our midweek times together. They're at Bravo Theater on Thursday nights. If you're visiting, please join us for those. They're incredible times. And then we're doing this, communion messages and talking about the Gospels as well. So we're going to really uh, just focus on this for the entire summer. And the framework, the idea that's kind of holding all this together is know why following Jesus in today's world. And you go, well, how come the series wasn't know how following Jesus, or know what about following Jesus. And I'd like to provide uh, an explanation through an example. So, uh, for example, say that you would like to go to college to finish a four-year degree, and you know what you want to do. You want to apply, and you want to go to college. You want to get this degree. How you will get this degree, well, you'll pay large sums of money, or borrow large sums of money, or somebody will pay large sums of money on your behalf, and you'll complete 6,000 lecture hours and homework hours over the course of four years, hypothetically, right? Um, but if you don't know why you're going to accomplish this degree, how likely are you to finish the actual work? Well, what if you have a reason why, and it's something like, my parents expect this of me? Or maybe, I don't know, I just... Everybody's doing it. I don't really have anything else to do the next couple of years of my life. <laughs> Maybe that ups the ante a little bit. You might have a little bit more willpower to get through some of the challenges, right? But what if your why is so paramount, so essential to your life goals and your identity and your passions that you literally can't ignore why you're doing what you're doing, such as... I'm going to finish school to finish this degree because with this education and this training, I'll be able to launch it as a career path I've always dreamed of. And I'll be able to benefit the world around me and help serve my family and myself to have a better life. How much more likely are you to push through the early mornings and the late nights and the study groups and all that stuff? Because this image of why is so clear. It's not mundane. It's not easily toppled by challenges. But it actually propels you to advocate for yourself and to discipline yourself and to develop and transform in character in order to accomplish the goal. Simon Sinek developed this idea in what's called the golden circle. Some of you guys may have heard this, right? And essentially it points out that all successful leaders and organizations and individuals start with why. Because when we start with the why, we're attempting to finish something or accomplish something or sell something or whatever. We solidify meaning for what we are doing. And we're far more likely to finish. When we start with what or even how we're going to do something, but we don't know why, our impact our ability to complete just diminishes. So know why following Jesus in today's world. You read the Bible, maybe you even come to church, but why? You abstain from certain indulgences and you, you put boundaries in your life around your lifestyle, but why? You don't give in to the current culture that's around you in your workplace or your school or your neighborhood. But why? And over the next few months, we're going to dive into the reasons why. We're going to discover this vision for God that God has for us really through His Son, Jesus, that we'll have answers to why. 
We'll know why. And it won't be just something that gets you up on Sunday mornings and gets the kids in the car and gets everybody to church. It will be an answer and answers that will engage your heart. That will help you to engage with the world around you as Jesus did. With love and with courage and with faith and with vision. And this is what the Gospels offer us. This is what we're after. This lens of not just what and not just how, but most importantly, why Jesus came to earth. Why he taught what he did. Why he loved those he loved. Why he died and resurrected. And what, with that, why we should care and why we should follow. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Can we get started? Okay, today we're going to start with know why the Bible is worth the study. Know why the Bible is worth continual study, continual you know, a, a relationship with. Many of the critiques that, uh, that come with not reading the Bible much are things like this. I've read it before. I know the stories that are in there. I love when I talk to people and you know, hey, have you ever read the Bible? Yeah, I read that back in camp when I was 12. Oh, okay. You remember the whole thing? Really? It's outdated. It's not intellectually challenging or or on board with it or it's not engaging enough. I don't understand what I read. And I would say fair. I, I would argue that most of us who go to church regularly feel some version of that at times in our time with the scriptures. In fact, it's always actually been a problem for people to engage with the scriptures. Take a look at this passage here in Matthew 13. You don't have to turn there. But in Matthew 13, this is Jesus speaking, by the way. He says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Which parables, if you don't know what that is, they were like little uh, stories, little allegories. But they were more like jokes. And there was a punchline at the end that threw you off. And Jesus would tell these parables, these stories. And they were kind of confusing to people. And you didn't always know. It's like, is he really talking about throwing seeds at a farmer? Or what is he after? And he says, this is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. So even in Jesus' day, people would read the scriptures or hear the message and not get it, and not really feel inclined to lean in and figure out why they're missing something. And Jesus says, that kind of relationship with the Word of God, what you're really missing out on is healing. A spiritual healing that opens your eyes, that illuminates how you view life, that opens your ears and your heart to see and understand God. So let's lean in. I would put before you, and I will, I'll put before you this morning, one of the most exciting passages of Scripture I've ever studied out. You can turn to Matthew chapter 1. We're not going to go through the whole thing just yet. But but here's the background. Just listen to the the backdrop of what's happening in Matthew chapter 1. Throughout the scriptural narrative, there have been promises for the people of God. Like from Genesis, literally from Genesis on, the people of God have been promised that one day, They would be under the reign and rule of a righteous king who would heal and restore and redeem their lives once and for all. And there's this cliffhanger, if you read the Old Testament, which is about that much of the Bible. There's this cliffhanger at the end of it that, that after thousands of years, after repeated exiles and famines and and occupations from enemies into their people and corrupt rulers and kings and hardships, that after all of that, this king is still not here. And 400 years go by, and there's silence. No prophets. No more revelations. And then suddenly Jesus appears. And 
And we have what we're going to read this summer, this unexpected servant king who teaches and provides the way of God of rest and renewal of our souls, who brings the reign and the goodness of the kingdom of heaven to earth, who conquers all of his enemies. And Matthew begins the story of the kingdom crashing in to earth. The arrival of the Messiah, the promise of redemption and renewal made available to everyone. He begins the story with a genealogy. Now, if you've ever had to fake the funk and smile through somebody's, you know, Ancestor.com DNA results as they share just a riveting story with you. (laughs) Uh, They're they're 18% Cherokee and their great, 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 great grandfather was, you know, born in the south of Spain somewhere. That's... That's amazing. That's that's not what this is, trust me. But just a heads up, we're going to read this actually twice. And the second time, I think uh, I'm going to give you my interpretation of it as my, you know, Eugene Peterson version of it uh, uh, as as I see it. But let's let's pick it up here in Matthew chapter 1. And if you don't uh, have a Bible, you can just read along here with this on the screen. Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, and Zerah whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nation, Nation the father of Sam, and Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. Wait, wait there's more. David, the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asaph. Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. Joram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah. And his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Just a little bit more. Isn't this amazing? After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah, the father of Shiltiel, Shiltiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihad, Abihad, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azar, Azar, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihad, Elihad, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And thus the 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Was that amazing or what? <laughs> Was that not riveting? You're like, or what? <laughs> okay, let me just I'm gonna point out a couple of things here. And can we just give a, a round of applause for our <laughs> I'm pretty sure she was just going to just look at the screen. <laughs> um, let me point out a few things that uh, you should know about this riveting part of the gospel. Is it okay if I just nerd out on you for like five or yes, six minutes? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, you know how numbers are important to the Jewish people? Yeah, they have what's called a gematria, uh, which is an alphanumeric code of assigning numerical numbers to names or words or phrases based on letters. So think about, like, if you're in Chicago in the 1990s and you're a basketball fan and, you know, somebody says to you, hey, did you see what 23 was out there on the board? Who are they talking about? Jordan, Jordan, right? So you know, okay, this number 23 is associated with Jordan, right? Like, you get that. That's kind of the idea about how numbers are assigned with language in the Bible. So in the Bible, certain numbers have meaning. Seven is one of those really important numbers. It's, it's God's perfection. It's his rest. Sabbath happens on the seventh day. The creation story has six days of work. And then on the seventh day, the kingdom of God has finally arrived. All is at rest and worships the creator. Now notice the way Matthew sections off his genealogy, his list. Matthew points out in his genealogy that he gives three sets of 14 generations, or six sets of seven. 
And then this is, you go, ah, that doesn't really, are you reaching? Actually, no, the Jewish reader would be focused on this. They'd be hearing this. They'd be paying attention to this. But there's only six sets of seven. So where is the seventh set? Who is the seventh generation? And so what the Jewish reader is tracking with Matthew is, oh, I'm the seventh generation that Jesus ushers in. Matthew is saying this perfection has come to you. He's saying something about God's completeness. His, his eternal rest has entered into your life in Jesus. How can we be sure of this? And I stole this last this part from Mark, John Mark Homer, but you know, this, this word genealogy that's used here in the Greek, it's actually not genealogy. In fact, if you read the Greek, it, it doesn't mean what genealogy means. Genealogy is used in other places in the Bible. It means like a list of your ancestors. Matthew uses this word Genesis. So, so what, what Matthew is saying is, he's saying, he's not looking backwards, he's looking forwards. He's tracking a new beginning. One scholar, set of scholars translated it this way. This is how they would have translated that first line of Matthew. The book of the new Genesis wrought by Jesus Christ. Isn't that good? So Matthew's saying it, without saying it, by the way, that the entrance of the kingdom of God's rule and rest has arrived in perfection and newness in Jesus. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Jewish people always trace their genealogies through the fathers, patriarchs, right? And Matthew chose to show Jesus' lineage, lineage through the fathers, but he also chose to highlight some mamas in there as well, right? And he does with some pretty scandalous mamas. Tamar uh, is the first of this story. And she's this non-Jewish woman. She's not part of the covenant people of God. Uh, she's widowed twice uh, by, by uh, her husbands. And, and in, in, in order to have a husband, as the law would call her to have a husband, she actually goes and s- disguises herself as a prostitute and sleeps with her father-in-law. That's Jesus' great, 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 great grandma. So there's this really awkward, sinful situation. It's full of sinful people, men and women in the story. But, but it's credited, she's credited with helping bring about this new Genesis. And all the Jewish readers are going like, what? Tamar? And then there's Rahab, who is an actual sex worker. She works in a brothel, and she helps a few Jewish spies under the command of Joshua, who is Jesus is named after him. She helps them escape. She spared the wrath of Joshua on the city because of that act. So this non-Jewish prostitute helps him, he makes this righteous and faithful decision and is spared the wrath of God and then is grafted in to the family of God and now part of the lineage of Jesus. And there's Ruth, this non-Jewish widow whose mother-in-law is Jewish but essentially wandered from her people and then through these small faithful acts of these two women, they're redeemed and welcomed back into the family of God. And this, this righteous man named Boaz, Boaz, whose name actually means pillars of the temple. So when you go to the temple, they would call them Boaz, the, the pillars. So literally, the guy's name is the temple of God. Does Jesus mention anything about being the temple in the Gospels, right? I was told to add a little bit of levity to this portion, and so this is my best effort at it. What was Boaz's favorite pickup line to Ruth? <laughs> Before you, I was ruthless. <laughs> it's cringy, I know. But the input was like, you gotta add some levity, buddy. Okay, Uriah's wife is the next one. Uriah is Bathsheba. We don't, she's not actually mentioned. Some people speculate that maybe that was to honor Uriah because he was murdered. He's not, she, he is not a Jew. We're not really sure if she is or not, but he's murdered by the greatest king in Israel's history so that what we have, so that this king could have Bathsheba. And from that union comes Solomon, the wisest man in all of history. And these, this lineage of royalty now is entered into Jesus through sin as well. So Matthew is literally bringing up some of the most scandalous moments in Israel's history and highlighting these women and these sinful people and these decisions of these people who are not actually God's people, but they're small acts of faith that led to the arrival of the Messiah. This is not the most flattering information you want to hear about the righteous one who will rule over you. But this is the gospel message. And you're going to read about this in the coming, coming months. Look, I don't come from perfect lineage, do you? 
And yet the message of Jesus is, neither do I. I relate. And he's saying that your spiritual background doesn't discount your ability to experience the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has made a way. And what's more is that God wants you actually to look back on your spiritual genealogy, for whatever that is, with gratitude. For what brought you here, the good and the bad, actually. And to know that even human free will and even sin cannot stop God from bringing about the good. God uses broken lineages with power to deliver his people. This is what Matthew is saying. Jesus subverts the expectations that only the perfect would get into the kingdom. Jesus invites into the family people of all nations and all spiritual backgrounds. And then finally here, well, not finally, there's two more quick things. One, they're all fathers, essentially, that, that, are, that are leading the lineage at this point. And then we get to the end. And Joseph is not mentioned as the father. It says, Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. So the question lies out there. Matthew just kind of leaves it out there. Who's the father? Jesus will tell us something about that as well. Okay, the last thing I'll point out, and then I promise the nerding out is done. You're like, I don't think so. Um, The last thing is, we don't get this in the NIV, but this is important that that Matthew actually, in his original writing, we read through these names, and there's this name Esau that comes up, Asa that comes out in the NIV, but it's actually not what Matthew wrote down. He actually wrote down Asaph, who is the guy who wrote all the Psalms, not all the Psalms, many Psalms. And and in Jesus' day, these Psalms were considered prophetic. And his first Psalm, Asaph's first Psalm literally forecasts the judgment to come and the manifestation of God. Asaph depicts the Messiah as judge and creator, promising to bestow mercy on those who return to him. Wink, wink, Matthew, right? And then he actually does it again with this guy, Amon, who we translated it Amon, but it's actually not what he wrote down. He wrote down Amos, who is also a prophet in the Old Testament. And he's the first one to use this phrase, the day of the Lord. Which is speaking to the time of God's justice to be done. That God would enter into earth's situation, into humans, into the human story, and bring justice and judgment. And Jesus certainly has something to say about that. So Matthew is saying with this one, you know, genealogy, a lot if you're familiar with the Old Testament, if you were sitting there reading this or hearing it for the first time as it was read, maybe in a house church or something, you would literally be on the edge of your seat. Here's my second reading of how you might have heard it, okay? Book of the new Genesis of Jesus Christ, the perfect one, the ruler of all creation who brings eternal rest of God. He is the royal king who invites all nations and all people, regardless of their past, into his story and into his family. He will redeem all who are lost. He will rescue those who will make faithful decisions to turn to him. He brings the judgment and justice of God, and the day of the Lord is his. He is the temple of God himself, and he is the Son of God, the long-awaited Messiah. That's what you would have heard. Nerding out done. <laughs> I know that was a lot, so just take a breath in for a second. Uh, I think it's recorded. You can always double back on some of that stuff. Look, I don't always read the Bible this way. I do sometimes just get up and read, and I don't really engage. And when I do that, I get little out of it. But I also often read the Bible with intent to understand, to listen, to lean into what the Word of God is saying. Now look, you don't have to have this kind of Bible study. You don't have to love to dive into the scholars and the Greek and the Hebrew and all of this stuff. That's fine. My point isn't that you have to do this in order to understand what's happening. My point is this, that if you don't study the Bible for more than what it says at first glance of your Western 21st century worldview, you will miss out on the whole thing. This is not some archaic 
outdated, simpleton collection of stories. It is the most intricate, sophisticated, 1,500-year-old collaboration of more than 60 artists and many other authors and contemplatives and kings and prophets and leaders and followers that has ever been combined in all of human history. It has been crafted and developed with such complexities and layers that scholars are still discovering new things 2,000 years later at the highest academic level. This is not a daily read and check the box piece of literature. You are interacting with the partnering of God's divine spirit with the best of human intellects. In all of history, nothing has been developed this way. It is unveiling truths that when you will lean in, when you will mine for, and you will discover, it will illuminate your eyes, open your ears, and heal your heart to experience God in a transformative way. Do not settle for just reading the Bible. Don't settle for just a Bible project daily passage. If you want to tap into this, if you want what's available to you this summer, opening your eyes and your ears and your heart to come alive, then you have to study what you read. You've got to dig in. You've got to research. You've got to get help. You go, I don't even know where to start. Get help. Maybe you're visiting for the first time and you go, this is kind of intimidating. I get it. But ask somebody who brought you, who invited you to sit down to begin the journey together with others. We do this in community. Apply yourself to learn. There's so much out there. Like we are living in the time of abundance of information. And there is so much at your disposal to dig in just beyond the surface layer and really figure out what they're teaching, what the Bible is after. There's podcasts, The Bible Project, and the Bema Podcast, and there's books, there's incredible literature. There's actually a book that's entitled How to Read the Bible Book by Book. So if you're really just out there guessing, you can get that book, okay? But the goal of your study is not information, it's transformation, and that happens when you discover the message of God. To behold His beauty, His wisdom, His love, His mercy, and to stand in that presence to find the good life as He designed it. Is transformative. The Bible is essential to our relationship with God. This is why we read the Bible, and we need to know why we're reading the scriptures. If we're going to keep at it, if we're going to keep discovering all that Jesus has for us, we have to know why. And I think it's going to, that, that phrase, know why, is going to become a little mantra amongst us this summer. Know why. Ultimately, we follow a Savior as we prepare for communion. We follow a Savior who knew why he came. He knew what he was starting in new humanity. He knew how he was going to do it, but he knew why. And that's the message that that Matthew's even laying out here in just the genealogy in chapter 1. He knew why because he was deeply in love with his creation. And he wants you and me and all of us. And he invites you and all of us into his story to be part of his family. And that, the Bible says, was the joy that was set before him so much so that he would endure the cross because he knew why. Let's pray for him.